sing thy grace streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious song sung by flaming tongues above praise the mount i fixed upon it mount of thy redeeming love jesus saw me when a stranger wandering from the fold of god he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious sinning I shall see thy lovely face clothing in my blood washed sinners how I'll sing thy sovereign you all the glory and all the honor because there is truly none like you 
It is an honor and a privilege to be able to praise you. It is an honor and a privilege to be able to come humbly before your throne of grace, to lay our lives before you, Lord God, as a gift because you are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our glory. You are worthy of our worship. And everything that is within us, let us praise him because he is God and God alone. We thank you, Lord God for your word that we are about to receive. We open our hearts, we open our minds, we open our spirits to receive it, O God. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that we can live our lives according to your will, according to your way. We lay down everything that we want for what you want for us. Have your way in the sanctuary, O God. Let it be less of us and all of you. Receive the glory from our lives. Thank you, Lord God, for what you've done. Thank you, Lord God, for who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Something about a video like that grabs our hearts because I think most of us remember as kids going through something like that and turn around and seeing dad, but it does show us also how our Heavenly Father sees us, and so we get to see the kind of the eternal perspective of that too. So while it has your hearts, let me tell, let me just ask you this stay there. Stay there with a yielded heart right now because where we're going today in this sermon 
is about our heart and where our heart needs to be. So I would ask that you just keep vulnerable for a little while while we talk about this. I want to welcome everybody. It's great to see everybody. Actually, it's great to see everybody. I think we ran out of worship guides. Gary, do you have a few in your hands? Did somebody miss getting one of our, they look like this. Did somebody come in and miss? Just raise your hand up. This is a great problem that we ran out of these. And so does anybody still need one? Because it has these sermon notes on the back, especially for our guests. I um, want to make sure you can tag along with us. Is there anybody still that needs one? Okay. We want to welcome everybody to our guests. We're really glad you're here. And actually, we've got to welcome everybody on live stream right now. So we're glad everybody's joining us um, as far away as you are. We're glad you're with us, too. The, um, my name is Brian. For our guests, my name is Brian. I'm one of the pastors here on staff, and we're finishing, this is always kind of bittersweet, we're finishing a sermon series on Amazing Grace today. And this has been kind of a fun ride, so we hate to stop, but there's other things we need to talk about down the road. But if you would bear with me, I think it's really important that I recap where we've been the last four weeks, because I think you'll see the flow of where we're going and why we're talking about the way we're talking about it. So the first week we talked about what is amazing grace? What is grace? Well, it's God's love coming at us. It's God's love and mercy coming at us. And it's, it's unfathomable, it's unmerited, it's unconditional. There's nothing we to deserve, do to deserve God's love and His grace. And so we paint a picture of what it is biblically in week one. Week two, we talked about the greatest act of grace ever was Jesus' death on the cross and His resurrection because that changed our lives. Now we have forgiveness for our sin. We have hope for eternity. And so we focused on that greatest act of grace in Jesus in week two. So what does that mean? So we have God's grace. We have the greatest act of grace. So la last week we went to, what does this grace mean to me? This grace can reach us, any of us, anytime, anywhere. We went through Psalm 23 to show not only can grace reach us in the darkest valley of the shadow of death, it reaches us because God is always with us. And so we've talked about grace, what it is, the greatest act, and how it can reach us. The last thing we're going to talk about is what do I do with the grace that God has given me? And so we're going to focus on that today. And so there's a very first note. So the one thing is thinking about is, is receiving and believing in grace is one thing. Living out grace is entirely something else. And so here's the first point I want to hit on here about amazing grace. Amazing grace is a free pass. And it's not. It's a free pass because grace comes to us like we talked about before. God's grace comes to us whether we've earned it or not. It is free, and it is a free pass for us no matter what we've done in our lives. But once we receive it, it is not a free pass. And then we go back and we look at the New Testament. We look at the church, the early Christian church, and their response to this amazing grace in Christ. And this young church had a couple of problems, and they used it for a free pass for a couple of things that it shouldn't be. The first thing the early church used, amazing grace as a free pass, is it was a free pass to get comfortable and go dormant. I mean, some people were, thought Jesus was coming back right away, so they said, I've got his grace, I'm changed, I'm following Jesus, but I'm not going to do anything about it. And they just ha kind of had a dormant life. They kind of got, today we would say, comfortable in their Christianity. The second free pass was that some took it and said, it's okay to keep sinning. Actually, some said, I can sin more. If God forgives me and loves me that much, I can keep sinning, because it's hard to beat it. Or... He loves to forgive, so why don't I sin more? That's actually the way people some felt. And so it was a free pass to keep doing the old things I used to do. Amazing grace is not a free pass to be comfortable, nor is it a free pass to sin more or continue sinning. And we still see the same thing in the struggle in the Christian church today. There's a scripture reference there, Romans 6, 1 through 4, and verse 14. And this kind of helps us with that a little bit, especially the sinning part. It says, it says, well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ in baptism, by baptism, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, 
now we may also live new lives. In verse 14, sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. So it's so cool when, it, when, it, when grace rolls out and the early Christian church was looking at this and they were struggling with the wrong response to grace, he brings up Paul's writing this to the church around Rome. He said, hey, he said, remember when you first believed and you were baptized as a follower of Christ? You were joined with him in his death. When you went into the water of baptism, you died to your old self. And just like Jesus rising on the third day, you rose out of the water new. You died to that old self. You died to the power of sin. It no more has hold on you. As believers, we are freed by God's grace from the power of sin. And so think about this. The only thing that can overcome sin is grace. It did it at the cross. It's doing it today. And that grace is going to keep us free from sin tomorrow. Grace. You ever think about that? Look how powerful it is. That's why it's so amazing. But there's one more thing. Not only is there a comfortable life, and not only is there uh, uh, the, the freedom to sin more, there's another free pass issue that I want to make sure I hit on here because it's a popular word today. And this is that next note. Grace doesn't produce legalism. It produces grace. If, if I wanted to fire up any of you in this room, is when you go out and live out your faith and somebody calls you legalistic. How many enjoy that? It's a stinging accusation. So what is legalism? You know, it's kind of a, an interesting thing to wrestle with. There's a lot of views of it, but let me, let me kind of simplify what legalism is. Grace should not produce this in our Christianity, in our hearts. Legalism, a great way to describe legalism is it's a heart condition that fails to be amazed that I'm saved by grace. Grace doesn't produce legalism towards ourselves. Legalism can be towards ourselves. It can be trying to earn God's forgiveness and acceptance through my obedience rather than the finished work of Jesus. And my legalism can be directed towards others. When I add rules above the gospel, the good news, when I add rules above the finished work of Jesus for somebody else to be right by God, that's legalism. We see legalism when those of us who are saved by grace use a different measurement for other people and even ourselves. We should have a heart that is stunned by grace, that is humbled by grace, that is filled with joy by grace. But legalism turns our hearts into prideful hearts. We lack mercy, we lack compassion. We're unkind, and we're impatient. And there's two more words that the outside world loves to look and call Christians, and that is hypocritical and judgmental. And largely those come from being legalistic in our heart. We earn that for a good reason, because we behave that way. Can I, can I, and I know this is a little tough place to be, but hang with me. Can I, we all will experience legalism at some times in our lives. It's actually, I think, an initial response many times. But here's some signs that you might have legalism in your heart. First is, you're not sure about your own salvation. You, you are still trying to earn God's favor through obedience and good works instead of the finished work of Christ on the cross. Legalism can affect yourself. Another sign of legalism in our heart is that the broken and the lost souls around us aren't important enough for us to ask. Another sign might be, I get angry when I see somebody else get grace. It's 
like, man, how do they deserve that? Does God really know them and what their past is? Another sign is I might constantly compare myself to others. I might say, yeah, I'm a Christian, I struggle, but I'm glad I'm not like that tax collector. There's a whole parable about this in the Bible if you want to read it. Or sometimes we pair ourselves, compare ourselves to other Christians. It's like, well, yeah, at least I'm not like this person. Do you know that they really... Another sign that we may have a legalistic heart is we believe people need to be cleaned up before they belong to the community of faith. Another sign is we may believe in joy and peace, but we never experience them. And the last sign that you might be legalistic in heart when it comes to grace is that you live in a Christian bubble, you have Christian friends, you go to Christian activities, and there's little else outside that. Those can all be signs of a legalistic heart that you receive grace, but you're doing the wrong thing with it. But that last note didn't leave you there. Grace does not produce legalism. It produces, say it loud, grace produces grace. It does. Grace produces grace. This is the one center theme we want to see the rest of the way here. Grace produces grace. So the next note here, embracing God's grace results in change and action. So how does grace produce grace? When we embrace it, it'll result in change here in our heart and it'll result in action. When we soak up you know what's been so fun about this series that keep getting to build each week? You think it's amazing? Listen to this. You think it's amazing, God's grace? Listen to this. Every week, more and more and more. Guys, it's even more amazing than that. It's more amazing than that. When we soak up how amazing God's grace is, everything His love has done to pursue us, protect us, grow us, save us. And I'm not talking just about past grace that we see with Christ. I'm talking about today's grace. The grace that we are here, we are breathing, we just worshiped great together. That same grace is going to get us through today. And God's promise that we have grace tomorrow. There's future grace. And that's so amazing. When that is so amazing, it changes us here. How can we miss this? And when our heart is so full of God's grace and gratitude for this grace, we move to action. And we see this in a scripture reference there is 1 Corinthians 15, 9 through 10. This is Paul, an early church Christian leader. And he's writing this to the, to the, to the Christians there in the area of Rome. And he writes this, he says, Hey, for I am the least of all the apostles. In fact, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. But whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out His special favor, His grace on me. And not without results. For I have worked harder than the other apostles, yet it was not I, but God who was working by his grace. Paul, you, you break this up, verse 9, I call it Paul the least. Paul says, I was a man who did everything under his power. Paul was a Pharisee, and his first name was Saul, and he was doing everything he could to stop the Christian church. He had a pile of cloaks at his feet as he endorsed the martyrdom of the first guy, Stephen. And then Paul was taking all his time Rounding up not men and throwing them in prison for being Christian. He was rounding up families and throwing them into prison. Doing everything under his power to stop the early Christian church. And then we got verse 10. He went from Paul the least to Paul the favored. And on the road to Damascus, I think he got knocked on his spiritual can <laughs> and he encountered Christ. Not only did he encounter Christ, he encountered his grace. And it changed him here. And he moved to be what I call Paul the Action Jackson. 
Not only did his heart change, Paul says, I moved to action. I became a man who did everything in my power to stop the church to a man who did everything through God's power to plant the church. The grace. And Paul says they're right in the last line, and it's not even me, but God's grace through me. Grace produces grace. So when we, as a church, as people, embrace God's grace, because it's so amazing, and we allow it to change us, how does that look and live through us? It's important to understand one thing about grace. It has life-giving power. The same grace that gave us life has the same life-giving power through us. So here is, here's some ways that we see how grace works through us. Grace is life-giving power that flows through four things. First, our presence. Our presence. You ever run around this joke in the family, you show up late to the supper table, and they said, oh, thanks for gracing us with your presence. Yes, grace comes with your presence. The minute you walk to the door in any situation, you bring the power of grace in you because the day you believed in Jesus, the day you decide to follow Christ, God gave you His Spirit and His power. All that grace is in you. So if it's in me, wherever I go, I have the power of grace. A power that's not mine. It's a supernatural power. So whenever I walk into somewhere, I bring the presence of grace. Second, and what's, let me go back. What's important about our presence is today in a technological world, it's easy to not be present. And we still need presence. The next thing we see is that we have life-giving power that's in our words. The very words we say from a spirit-filled life have power. We did a whole sermon series on this a while back. Let me just make this note. On, on a, before we type anything, before we text anything, before we blog anything, before we say anything, ask this question. Are my words filled with life-giving grace? And if they're not, stop. Our grandmothers and grandfathers taught us if you can't say anything nice, don't say it at all. Let me change that. If you can't say anything with grace, don't say it. And ladies and gentlemen, we can get all wound up all we want about the social media world and what's being happening out there and what's going on. You have a choice every time you go out on the wide world web, you have a choice to use words of grace or words of garbage. Garbage will produce garbage. Grace will produce grace. So when you're typing that comment or you're forwarding that story that you don't know the other side of the story, check yourself. Am I producing grace? Is there a grace in what I'm doing? If there's not, please stop. Don't do it. If you don't like the social media world, get off of it. Otherwise, go to it and bring life-giving grace to it. That's what I'd love to see out of all God's people. Our words have life-giving power of grace. Next is our works. Grace is life-giving power that flows through our works. Sometimes we don't like that word works. We, we put negative connotation. It's a beautiful word. Our works, our deeds are vitally important. When our heart changes, we should see it move to action. Those works don't save us, but they're clear evidence of our heart being changed by that grace. Our touching, our fixing, our baking, our giving, those are all tangible actions of God's love and grace towards others. Life-giving works through grace. And the last one, this one, I know it hits all of us. 
Grace is life-giving power that flows through our forgiveness. There is so much power in the grace of forgiveness. But let me tell you, there is no middle ground on the issue of forgiveness. Now, this might be issues of I need to be forgiven, or this might be issues I need to forgive myself, or these might be issues of I need to, to, to forgive somebody. But let me tell you, in all those three arenas, there is no middle ground. There is either grace and forgiveness, or there is bitterness, and there is nothing in between. If I choose to withhold forgiveness, I have bitterness. There's nothing else left. And for those of you who have been stuck in forgiveness, we all get stuck there at times. We decide to hold on to the bitterness instead of allowing the grace-giving power of forgiveness. And how amazing is forgiveness? When they asked Jesus, they said, how many times should I forgive? Seven? That seems like a lot of grace. He goes, no, 70 times seven. That's grace. That's the grace because every day of our life, probably we need forgiveness. We need to extend forgiveness. We have the power of life-giving grace through forgiveness. What I think is really cool is there's, those are just four simple things that how grace produces grace through us, but there's this really neat scripture verse that references Titus 2, 11 through 15. This kind of brings it all together. It summarizes kind of the whole sermon here. And this is what it reads. It reads, For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. While we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ will be revealed when he comes back. Jesus gave his life to free us from every kind of sin to cleanse us and to make us his very own people. Totally committed to doing good deeds, actions. And you must teach these things, disciples, and encourage the believers to do them. What we're sharing here in Titus is God's grace was revealed in Jesus. Through Jesus, we have been given grace to be set free, to be cleansed, to be right with God, and to be totally committed to doing good stuff. Then God's grace through us in action brings freedom to others, cleanses them from their sin, makes them God's people so their lives will produce grace and impact others, and not by any power that we have, but by His power. So what does this mean to us as a church today? God is still giving God's, I'm sorry, Jesus is still giving God's amazing grace to the worst people. Jesus is still giving amazing grace to other people, and it's even more amazing when it goes through us, the church. Jesus is still alive in our hearts today, and he's still moving us to action to meet people in their worst sin in the worst circumstances, in the worst darkness. Christ's church has a mission to share grace. Our church has a vision that embraces that vision. Be bold. Don't let fear hold you back. That is not of God. Love loud. What that means is it's not how loud it is. It's how loud that it, it just drowns out the culture and there's no more amazing love that's loud than through amazing grace. And engage deeply. Get the invite to enter into somebody's life and help them experience this amazing grace. We should all have one in our life right now that we're sharing this amazing grace with. At least one. Who is your one? And there's this quote from a book, Grace Eventually, and it reads this. It says, it's incredibly touching when someone who seems so hopeless, hopeless finds a few inches of light to stand in. It makes everything work as well as possible. All of us lurch and fall. We sit in the dirt. We're helped to our feet. We keep moving. We feel like idiots. We lose our balance. We gain it. 
We help others get back on their feet, and we keep going. Grace. So many people are out there that need just a few inches of light. Do you have that in you through your presence for listening to somebody who just lost a job? You have it in your encouraging words to help somebody who's battling divorce? You have it through your hands to make a tray of cookies to a neighbor whose mother just passed away? Or you have the ability to bring a few inches of light to tell someone today, I forgive you. Or, would you forgive me? Last point today is God's grace. This isn't in your thing, so feel free to write it down. God's grace is most amazing in conflict. Can I tell you something about the church in Christ's church? And that is that it's geared for conflict. If you go to a church that doesn't have conflict, run out the door. Do not stay there. We are a church that doesn't believe you have to be cleaned up before you come to Jesus. We are a church that doesn't believe you have to clean, be cleaned up before you come in. These doors are part of this community. We are a church that believes the worst are welcome because this is where Jesus cleans people up and cleanses them. And we're a church that believes the same measure of grace that God gives us and we're trying to give that same measure to others that is why grace is so 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 amazing and it is just amplified when it's through us after four weeks of telling you how amazing grace is I think it's best we finish it with a real life story of amazing grace. I'm joyously exhausted about this. <laughs> and I hope you are too. But there's one more story that's real, happening right here in our church, about amazing grace. Watch this video with me. I'm Giovanni Garcia. I'm from Cuba. Back in 95, it's gonna sound wrong, but I start serving the. It's kind of like voodoo, but I decided to go to the dark side. You can believe in God, but you can express it like somebody else. If you express it somebody else and you got the wrong person, yeah, the person 10 to 15 years in prison. So that's one of the reasons, that probably one of the major reasons I take the other side. Eventually that stuff almost lose me because because the Buru of Santeria of the how we call in Cuba. I lose my daughters, I lose my house, I lose my ex wife, I lose everything. I end in the street. Back in two thousand and three I was facing five years in prison. I was in jail. Mistake we made. And inside jail, it was this guy, Cuban. He was a pastor. He do something bad, and he ain't out there. But every every afternoon, we got like a little group, and we talk about God. I do it because I don't want to spend time inside. So little bit outside jail was. But I start getting like a little questions and kind of interesting what he's talking about. The night before I was, the night before I got to the court, I have this dream, beautiful dream. I think it was the most beautiful dream I ever had in my life. It was so real. I was talking to a friend of mine, it was a big church inside. I was talking to a friend of mine in Cuba. It wasn't my dream for some reason. And I was talking to him, 
and I saw this angel coming from the ceiling. Angel with a sword. And so I saw him, and the guy told me, what are you looking at? I said, don't tell me you don't see the angel out there. And he turned around, he saw the angel. So the angel was coming down with the sword. And he stepped in front of me and looked at me, and the angel looked back. And I looked back at me, I said, whoa, somebody behind me. Swear to God, Pastor, it was Jesus. Jesus was saw in picture. Jesus was saw in picture. I saw him behind me. I turned around. I started crying in my dream. I look at him. I said, you're real. You are real. And he touched my shoulder, and he said, everything's going to be all right. Next day, free to go home. No charges, no nothing. He gave me another break. Like, I don't know how many breaks he gave in my life. I think it's his mercy. December 30, 23, I was reborn again. I don't care about what happened before that. I care about December 23rd on. December 23rd, being reborn again. And my second step is be baptized. And my last hope, my last hope is getting to heaven. That's my last hope. This is Johan. Would you make him feel welcome? <laughs> Johanny has a little bit of an accent being from Cuba, but just to make sure you understood that story, he immigrated here from Cuba, uh, being involved uh, at one time in Voodoo, Santeria, um, a really dark place to be. He came to America and then, and then talk about amazing grace. Uh, it started with a pastor that was in prison with him who shared the good news. But he was still on a journey, a lot of questions, right, Yohani? And one day he moved him to a neighborhood here in Manhattan, and this guy, Casey Gladstone, part of our church, was there, the neighbor, went over one day, started with his presence, and then his words, and Casey showed him amazing grace. Next we know, Yohani showed up here about what? A year ago? Six months ago? And he started seeing that amazing grace through all you. And he said everything changed December 23rd. And it was a song. Yep. And Lene could probably tell me what that song was. But the words of the song changed his heart forever. This is just three, four weeks ago. And today he's here. The very waters we talked about in Romans 6, he's, because of that grace, he wants to share that he's a follower of Christ. So, you want to it's a great day to do this and show everybody God's amazing grace. So I'm going to let him tell those stories. So I just want to make sure you caught all that. <laughs> Casey's joining me. Uh, here to help him, and so yeah, the water's great. <laughs> hey, no cell phones, no cell phones or anything. No. <laughs> you just said it was warm. Yoani asked me to read this for him because he speaks Spanglish. <laughs> and also because he's kind of like me, shy and introverted. Yoani was raised in Cuba where Christianity was outlawed until 1995. His family is Catholic and Yoani was baptized as a baby. As he got older, his brother and he started following Santa Lia, which is a part of voodoo. Yoani left Cuba and legally moved to Florida in 2000 and continued with Centralia. In 2015, he moved to Kansas to be with his best, 
with his fiance Betsy. Betsy's family is Christian, and they tried to get Yoani back into church. Thank you, Betsy. He wanted to make sure I said that to you. Okay. Hey, Casey. Can I jump in? Sure. They're watching his family back in Cuba. Yes. So they're probably his, watching right now on live stream. His That's mother so is so supposed to be watching a live stream. Hi, Mama. <laughs> Yoni was guided to live across from me. I would talk about church and the Bible to him whenever we were together. I thought he was a believer at the time. About six months ago, I started talking to him more about following Christ, and he started coming to church with me. <coughs> Sorry. And as he said, on December 23rd, he gave his heart to God while praying with Pastor Art. Yohani wants to thank Pastor Brian and Pastor Art for their guidance in his walk with Christ. Today, he is asking to be baptized to, to continue on his path of Christianity. ability of God's power in any of us but today we're celebrating with you that now this light and grace is in you and now God has a tremendous work to do through you Yohani. so you cross your arms for me there you go Yoni based upon your beautiful expression of your love for Jesus Christ your journey to this point we now baptize you in the name of the Father of his son Jesus and of the Holy Spirit. I would like to share that um, we're going to have a baptism probably in a few weeks. If you're at that point of life where I've never made that commitment to respond to God's amazing grace through Jesus, all you have to do is write on that worship guide right there on the bottom. I would like to know more about baptism, and we'll walk with you. Uh, right around Easter, we'll do this next baptism together. We would love for you to make that step today. Amen? Amen. 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 We are going to close with a kind of a rocking song. Ushers, would you come forward? We're going to pass the baskets and the bags as we sing. Feel free to stay standing. Um, it's a bit of a bold song, and we are not afraid of that, because if you just heard our mission statement, we are a church who will be bold and love loud. And the reason we are that is one reason alone, and it is to make him known. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, will you bless this offering? Thank you for your mercy and your grace that is all over Yuani's life, and uh, I pray as we leave here at the end of today that we would lead with the same grace that you have extended to us. Amen.
Give us words to speak your truth.